Friends, as we gather today for this time, we come uh, before God and we have been uh, studying the Lord's Prayer, this simple prayer that we have just said. And so today we come to that point in the Lord's Prayer where we talk about God's kingdom come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Simple words. But what did they mean for the disciples and what do they mean for us today? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We find the Lord's Prayer in a couple of places in our Bible, we find it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, and we also find it in Luke chapter 11. But today our focus is on kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like Jesus says. Jesus attempts in a variety of different ways to explain to his listeners what living as God created us to to live is really all about. Having been under the constraints of the Roman system for so long, it was difficult for most folks to, to even begin to grasp what it would mean to truly believe in an alternative system. A system in which God and not Caesar was the head. Living in a, a culture of political domination and a society made up largely of those that are not committed to Christians, uh, I, I believe that Christ's alternative vision of the world is just as relevant today as it was more than 2,000 years ago. And one of the difficulties that we contemporary Christians face today is that over the course of the 200 years or so in America, the, the church has become institutionalized and entrenched, if you will. The American way of life has somehow taken over the church. And it's moved us away, I believe, from the simple message of Jesus which was to love God and love your neighbor and to go and make disciples. Instead of working for the kingdom of God, working to change the world, we've been much more content to work on our personal salvation and pray that God would sort of take care of the rest. Friends, this may not, or this may be new to you, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is not about saving individual souls. It's not about getting souls into heaven. For most Christians, knowledge of personal salvation is the ultimate goal, right? The ability to answer in the affirmative that question that some may ask you, are you saved? Well, friends, that can mean different things to different people. Folks, I believe that, that we've been asking the wrong question for too long. The question isn't whether or not you've been saved, but rather, what are you doing now? What are you doing now with the knowledge that God's free gift of grace has been given to you? How has your life changed because of that knowledge? See, salvation is not a one-time event, but rather it's a lifelong process of growing into the knowledge and the love of God and I believe that Jesus knew that he understood that in in his parables he speaks not of personal salvation not individualism but rather he speaks about the transformation of the world as the people knew and as they lived it See, the point is that Jesus attempts to explain the kingdom of heaven in terms that the people could understand. And in his explanations, 
he's not speaking about some whimsical heaven, some otherworldly heaven. Rather, he speaks about an earthly heaven, a heaven in which the world is transformed back into what God intended it to be. As the Apostle Paul would say, it's a new creation. And that's the good news that Jesus brings. The good news that God's kingdom is near. Near enough to embrace. Near enough that we can sense it. Work together to to see that it comes into being. This is why he says that the disciples should pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when we understand this concept, then we're much more motivated to change our lives and start acting like God actually intends to transform the world today. We're much more likely to use the gifts that that God's given us to make a difference in our lifetime rather than sit back and relax because somehow we've got our ticket to salvation punched. I think for many, some believe that they have their ticket punched and their bags are already packed. And we're just waiting. But friends, that's not what God calls us to do. That's not what Jesus said we should do. The word used in the Lord's Prayer for kingdom is the Greek word basilia, which means the reign of the king. And so it's the king's domain of which we speak. It's the king's dominion. It's the people and the places that are all under the rule and the reign of the king. Now, I remember when I was a little kid, one of the things that we loved to do was to, to play about kings and, and queens and, and all of that kind of a thing. We would build forts and we would build castles and someone would be the king. For some reason, I, I never really got to be the king. I don't know why that was. I always had to do stuff. The king didn't have to do much of anything. See, the, in our game as well as the king of which Jesus was speaking, the king is the enforcer, the protector, the leader. The king has this place of responsibility. Right? The king protects and provides and, and guides his people and that's, friends, that, that's not oppressive, that's opportunity. That's not beratement, that's beneficial, because everything that the king has in this concept, everything that the king owns is available to those who put their trust in him. Friends, when we submit to the rule and the reign of Christ, all his character, all his giftings, all his goodness then we have access to all of those things. But when we have access to the things of God, we also have responsibility, friends. We come before Him, we receive these things, but He asks us to go and to do. To make a difference in His world, in this world. We know from our experiences Right, that a kingdom can go bad, don't we? We've read about or heard about kingdoms that become corrupted. Sometimes kings use their power to abuse others. We read about seasons where wars were waged and where crusades were launched all in the name of Christianity. But we know that some of those things were done for the kingdom of mankind. Jesus comes along and He doesn't say pray for a kingdom. He doesn't say pray for your king. He doesn't say pray for a religious kingdom. He says pray to your heavenly Father thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. See, thy God's will, not mine. 
When we say thy, we recognize that we are below someone. We are not on the top. We are the doers and not the ones sitting on the throne. Thy kingdom, kingdom, His establishment, His rule, His grace on earth. Come to to be present, to happen. God's will, not ours. God's will, not ours. Be done. To be accomplished, finished, completed. May God's kingdom come on earth. May God's kingdom break into now. And give us a glimpse of what it's like in heaven. The tone, the tenor in the Greek language is a tone of resolution. Of resolve. Of putting your foot down and making a declaration saying, Come kingdom. Come will of God. Come heaven moments to earth even now, friends. It's a declaration Now the fact is that that we're taught to pray for the will of God and the kingdom of God to come because for many people and places today, friends, it's not. It's not. It doesn't rain. And so we, we pray for those things and God looks and He sees divisiveness today. And He sees disrespect. And God sees apathy He sees murder and he sees abuse and he sees all these things. And God says, these things are not my will. And when we pray that God's kingdom would come, we're praying for a kingdom that is vulnerable to human free will and our tendency to sin. But friends, when God's kingdom comes in the heart, those dark places, those selfish motives that we have, those places of sin in our lives, those things can be changed. Those things will be transformed. See, when the kingdom of God comes into us, God transforms us. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we're praying that God would uproot our egocentric nature. And replace it with an altruistic one. We're we're praying that He would uproot our selfishness. And replace it with selflessness. That we would take away our, our, our greed. And in its place put generosity. We're praying that He would replace supremacy with servanthood. Release forgiveness over resentment. Friends, God's kingdom is a kingdom of love, of light, of mercy, of justice, of forgiveness, of grace. A grace that can reach the depth of the human soul. I think too often when we pray this prayer, we just sort of gloss over it. What would it look like in your life for God's Kingdom to come into your life. What would it look like for God to break into your life today, friends? That's what we're praying for in this prayer. In the first half of the Lord's Prayer, we we pray three petitions to God, three requests to God. And in them we see, may God your name be sanctified. Hallowed be thy name. Remember we talked about that last week. Then may your kingdom come. And then we say, your will be done. I think for God's will to be done in our lives is even more difficult to ask than God break into our life. Because God, friends, we are selfish by our nature. Everything that we're taught in this life today is about us. 
rather than reaching out to others. In these three petitions, the first two of these, God, may your name be sanctified and your kingdom come, those are realized only when God's will is done. When we surrender, when we submit to the will of God and we allow Him to come into our lives and lead us and guide us and direct us, that's when God is glorified. God is glorified by His actions in our obedience. And Jesus understands and He recognizes that repentance is the door to God's redemptive purposes. For God showing up in our lives. And so we confess and we repent. And that's the first part of God's will being done in us. Jesus says to the disciples, stop looking on the outside. Instead, look at the innermost parts of the heart. But friends, how often do we want the power without the repentance? Right? How often do we want the power that God would give us without the repentance? It's much easier to confess than it is to repent, isn't it? St. Alphonsus Liguria One of the church fathers wrote, For a good confession, three things are necessary. An examination of conscience, sorrow, and a determination to avoid sin. First, it starts with an examination of the self. Psalm 139, in that psalm, the psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Friends, we must take time to examine ourselves if God's kingdom is going to come into our lives. We have to examine ourselves to allow God to look at the dark places of our hearts, at at those prideful places that we've allowed in and that we've closed our eyes to. Those places that need to be pushed and changed and molded. And second, there should be a sorrow A contrition within us. Our brokenness, friends, is the beginning of God's grace. Psalm 51, 17 reads, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. The Puritans in early America used to call this the gift of tears. The gift of tears. They saw this as a gift because it was a sign that their conscience was working when they had repented, when they were aware of their sin. I think for many of us, we need this gift of tears. The early Puritans didn't call themselves Christians, they called themselves repenters. I think we can take something from that, from our heritage. Some of us confess things just to get them off of our chest, don't we? I know that. Some of you have confessed things to me. And it does feel good when we make our confessions, doesn't it? It makes us feel better about ourselves. But friends, that's just one part of it. We're asked to do something with that confession. We're asked to receive God's forgiveness and to change our ways. Friends, we've got to actually make a determination, a resetting of our course. The word repent means to to turn around. Pastor and theologian uh, Bill Johnson suggests that repentance is not just a turning. The focus of repentance is to change our way of thinking until the presence of God's kingdom fills our consciousness. Over and over and over again, Jesus calls us to repentance. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent. And believe in the good news. Thy will be done. It's not just repentance. It's also belief. And it rests on faith. And faith is not just some kind of 
abstract thinking out there. Our, fa- our faith is in a God, friends, who took on flesh, who lived among us, who came to us. And our faith is in Christ that can transform us. And that transformation comes through confession and repentance and belief. Friends, the act is, or the fact is, that we've attempted to convert God's kingdom into something politic, into a place, into an affiliation. But the fact is that the kingdom of God reigns and exists in our hearts, within our souls. And it exists there through faith and through grace. See, Jesus says in Luke 17 that the kingdom of God does not come with careful observation, nor will people say, here it is. I think sometimes we believe that we'll know, here it is, here is God's kingdom. But the scripture continues and says, the kingdom of God is within you. Think about that for a moment, friends. The kingdom of God is within you. The capacity to change and to be transformed is within you. The Apostle Paul So that when we believe in Christ, when Christ is in you, that transformation occurs. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And he uses that language, that language of intensity, the intensity, the chaos of birth. Because that's what it's like when we begin to receive God and we begin to Be transformed. It's not easy. It's a shaking up of the soul. It's an uprooting of the sin, the habits that have hold of us. And it's a transformation that occurs within. And it's not easy. When we pray that God's kingdom would come into our lives, friends, we're praying for a transformation from the inside out. And it's difficult. Jesus didn't just come to bless us. He came to save us. He didn't just come to to give us a second chance. He, He came to give us a second birth. He didn't just come to revive us. He came to give us a resurrection. And He came to give us power. And He calls us out of our our messed up lives. Our broken lives. Those dark places he calls us out of that and he gives us new life and friends that's good news how many of us need to to hear that how many of us examine our lives and say this is not the life that i should be living this is what the kingdom of god is all about That's what the kingdom of God looks like. And it is messy. And it's difficult. There are people all around this place today who are in need of new life. Just turn on the news, friends. Walk out your front door. Look in the mirror. We're in need of new life today. And it's in Christ Jesus that we're made new. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. Friends, that's good news. Thy will be done, we pray. And it starts with accepting God's will, with accepting His ways. It starts there, but it really takes off when we begin to live it out. When we start to practice that. In verse 20, just three verses later, the Apostle Paul continues, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And so God were making His appeal through us. 
Friends, God is making His appeal through us. What are we doing to help to bring forth the transformation of the world today? When we are born of a new kingdom, we, come, we become a, a sent people. We become ambassadors. We have access to all of the kingdom of God. But friends, with that comes responsibility. We're not supposed to just sit on a throne as though we were God. We're to go as servants of God so that others can come to know God's kingdom in their life. In Matthew 13, 33, Matthew writes, The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Again, Jesus trying to explain what this kingdom, this transformation of life is like. In this scripture, Jesus is saying the yeast changes everything. It's an active agent. It's just a small living thing. You know, when I gather here on Wednesdays with uh, the Lions Club for lunch, a lot of the times I know that the yeast is moving and working as soon as I open the door. There's nothing like a good yeast roll, is it? But friends, you can't have a roll without the yeast. Something has to move and transform that substance, that dead life into life. And that's, friends, what Jesus is getting at here. When we accept and when we pray that God's will be done, that His kingdom come, we're saying, God, be like that yeast in our life. Bring new life to us. And here's the thing about yeast as well. It doesn't do anything unless things begin to heat up. Let me tell you, when you pray for God's kingdom to come into your life, things will heat up. Things will heat up in your life. Things will heat up as you begin to approach life differently. But friends, when we allow that to happen, transformation happens. When we understand that concept, then we're much more motivated to change our lives and start acting like God actually intends to transform the world through us. We're much more likely to use the gifts that God has given us to make a difference in our lifetime instead of waiting for heaven somewhere else. Friends, the kingdom of God is near. It's near enough to embrace. It's near enough that we can sense it, to work together, to see that it comes. We're not placed here to live a life to get our ticket punched for heaven. God's grace has already done that for us. Do you get that? God's grace has already done that for us. We don't have to fear that there isn't enough precious time to get done everything that we want to get done in this life. Because when we accept the vision that Jesus cast of the kingdom of heaven, we live our life not for ourselves, but for God and for our neighbor. The question isn't, are you saved, friends? The question is, is how has your life been changed through the knowledge of God's love for you? And it also becomes, what are you doing in your life today, right now, to bring about a transformation in this world in which we're living today? A world that's broken, that's fleeting, that's hurting, that's messed up. 
What are we doing? What are we doing personally? And what are we doing as a church? What are we doing with the knowledge that God's kingdom is near? I ask you to consider how the world would be different if we started living our life for God rather than for ourselves. What might it be like if we invited others to do the same? You think maybe, just maybe, we might begin to experience a little bit of God's heavenly kingdom in our lives. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's take that to our hearts today. As we accept the power of the Spirit in our lives and begin that process of transformation today. Let us pray. God, we hear a message about the dark places in our life, Lord. The sin in our life. And the need to be transformed. So Lord, today we pray Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, transform us from the inside out. Give us the confidence to know, Lord, that we are forgiven. That we are empowered. And send us out, Lord. So that the transformation that we experience in our life. Might be experienced in this wider world. So that indeed we can see your kingdom here. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.